Well, today we're going to end our series in Joshua, and I've preached through the entire book of Joshua. There have been some parts that I skipped over because we don't want to read three or four chapters of names, but we've talked about all the major stories in the book of Joshua, and this last one is one of my favorite in the entire book of Joshua. Now, if you're not familiar with the Bible or you haven't been to church much, uh, Joshua was Moses' assistant. And he helped lead the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And God used Joshua actually to be the commander, the military leader, to bring the Israelites into the promised land. And uh, so during this story that we're going to see today, they've already begun their conquest. They started with Jericho. The walls fell down. Uh, They've been going through, and God has been giving them a victory. Uh, from city to city. So in this story, they're ramping it up in in the region because the different nations or states, nation states uh, of, of that area of that time had heard that the Israelites were going through and they were winning and that God was delivering this land to them. And so what they did was They said, you know what we're going to do is we're going to gather together the strength in numbers, right? And so not one, but five kings came together. And they said, we're going to conquer this rogue nation, this crazy group of people that are coming through and conquering our land, and we're going to bind together all of our armies, five combined armies, and we're going to defeat them. But God spoke to Joshua and reassured him that he was going to give him a great victory over these five city-states, nation-states, these five kings at one time. And Joshua believed it so much, and he realized the urgency of it so much that the Israelite warriors marched all night long to surprise these five kings these five combined armies, and God gave them a great victory. In fact, one of the things that the Bible tells us that God sent giant hailstones that killed more of the enemy than the actual Israelite warriors killed of the enemy. Incredible story. I've never been in a hailstorm that bad. Now, I've been in a hailstorm that put little pings and dings in my car uh, or uh, messed up my roof, or I'd have the roof replaced, but I've never been in a hailstorm so bad that it would actually kill you. And so God was fighting for the Israelites. And this incredible story that we're going to read today is about Joshua realizing the urgency of the moment. And he realized that he was running out of daylight to do what God had called them to do what God had promised to do. And he prayed one of the most audacious prayers in all of Scripture. In fact, there's nothing like it in all the Bible. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to learn from this audacious prayer that Joshua prayed, and we're going to learn some things about our own life and about our own prayer life and how God wants us to pray. So begin reading with me in Joshua chapter 10. And we're going to only read three verses, verses 12 to 14. It says, And at that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, now get the picture, they are fighting the battle already. And in the middle of the battle, Joshua prays a prayer. Now, I want you to notice something that maybe you didn't pay attention to or it didn't make much impact when you read it. Notice what it said when he prayed. He said this in the sight of Israel. Now, why would he put that in there? Because faith is not truly faith until you put it out there. It's one thing to say, oh, I have faith, and you don't tell anybody. You don't really uh, let anybody know. You kind of keep it to yourself just in case you're wrong. You don't want to get egg on your face. You don't look like an idiot. But you know what real faith does? It puts it out there. It puts God to the test. It lets others know 
that you're trusting in God. He said this in front of the entire group of Israelite warriors. And look at what he says. This is his prayer. Son, stand still at Gibeon. Son, stand still. <laughs> Do you realize how incredible a prayer that is? He wasn't praying, Lord, uh, make us more effective. God, protect us. God, bless us. God, bless our food that we're going to eat today. He says, God, make the sun stand still. Incredible. And moon in the valley of Ajalon. Wow. I mean, he prays literally that the sun would stand still. And the sun stood still. <laughs> That's a pretty good prayer, isn't it? The sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Yashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. And this is the key to this text and understanding how to pray this kind of prayer, understanding that God fought for Israel, but God will also fight for you. That's one of his names. He is Jehovah, the Lord who fights for us. And so I, this is not a science lesson, but a faith lesson. But nevertheless, for the skeptics that might say, well, this is just a story, this is a myth, nothing like this has ever happened. Well, let me just kind of challenge your thinking on that. It has traditionally been believed that this event did actually occur. He said, well, so what? A group of religious people believe this uh, occurred. Well, this has been recorded in ancient sources as well. The wisdom of Syriac, uh, Josephus supported this belief. So did Augustine, Jerome, Luther, and Calvin. But if that's not enough for you, did you know that scientists from Harvard and Yale, no less, had discovered, this has been a number of years ago, they discovered uh, that there was a day missing from the astronomical calendar. One day. They were figuring this out, and I don't remember exactly why they were studying this, but they discovered that there was a day missing. And if you take two events from Scripture, it fully explains where those, that one day went. This story, obviously, it says it was about a day not quite 24 hours. And there's another story in the Bible about King Hezekiah who prayed for the sun to go backwards 10 degrees. That was about the space of about 40 minutes. And that explains where that day went. Now, once again, this is not a science lesson. This is a faith lesson. This is to teach us how to have faith and how to pray. And so, this incredible prayer that Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still, and God answered his prayer, and I want to make some applications for us so that we can learn how to pray audacious prayers. First of all, here's the first question, what is an audacious prayer? What makes up an audacious prayer? Is an audacious prayer just something that you're praying selfishly? Oh, God, I want to win the lottery, and if you let me win the lottery, then I'm going to give a lot of money to the church, to the cause of Christ. Well, that's not really an audacious prayer because that is a prayer that is simply centered around what you want. Now, we know several things about prayer from Scripture. We know that prayer is simply talking to God. There are a lot of people that don't think they know how to pray, but if you know how to talk, you know how to pray. If you can talk to a friend or a family member, then you can talk to God. And a lot of times people don't realize that they actually are praying when they're praying. Because oftentimes when we're having this conversation with God in our mind, that is actually prayer. What is prayer? It's simply talking to God. We also know that God wants us to pray. 
He tells us to pray. He wants to have communion and conversation with us. And so whenever you talk to God, don't think that you're bothering God. I I hear people say this kind of stuff. Well, I know he's too busy running the universe. Well, man, you have a very small picture of God if you think that he doesn't have time to hear your prayer when he's asked you in Scripture to pray. Of course he has time for you. You say, well, what about all the stuff in the world, all the stuff in the universe? No problem for God. The one that can speak a word and the universe comes into existence has no problem taking time to hear your prayer. God wants you to talk to him. We also know that prayer is aligning ourselves with God. It's aligning ourselves with his authority. Uh, In the model prayer that Jesus gave, he said, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that we're saying, Father, Heavenly Father, we're aligning ourselves up under the authority of God. And it also tells us that we're doing this for his cause, his glory, his kingdom. And then a key to get every prayer that you ever pray answered is this, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Well, we're talking about audacious prayer. What makes an audacious prayer? Well, we know that prayer is asking and receiving. We know that uh, God wants us to pray for his will. And we also know that the Bible tells us we should pray about everything. Now, I want to show you this from Scripture so you understand the difference between any kind of prayer and an audacious prayer. Listen to these verses, Luke 18, 1. This is the words of, these are the words of Jesus. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to illustrate their need, notice, for constant prayer and to show them that they must keep praying until the answer comes. Now, what does that mean, constant prayer? Does that mean while you're driving down the road, you got your eyes closed? I hope not, all right, because that would mean a whole lot of accidents and a whole lot of hospital, vi- hospital visits, Okay. So obviously, he's not talking about bowing your head, and he's not talking about reciting the Lord's Prayer all the time. He's talking about having that awareness, that consciousness of God in your life. Are you able to have conversations with God at work, on the way to work, on the way home, uh, in the evening before you go to bed? Once again, you should take time to pray, but we also should pray all the time. That's what the Bible tells us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray all the time. In case you missed that thing that Jesus said, he said, pray all the time. So that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about that we um, fold our hands and close our eyes and bow our knee, but he's talking about being aware of the presence of God and being aware of conversation with God all the time. And then in case you're wondering about what you should pray about, listen to what Philippians 4, 6 says, don't worry about anything. That's a big one, isn't it? Don't worry about COVID-19. Don't worry about the economy. Don't worry about all the stuff you see on the news. Don't worry about which politician you think is lying and which ones you think are telling the truth. Don't worry about your job. Don't worry about your health. He's not saying don't take care of these things. He's saying don't worry about anything. Why? Because worry doesn't accomplish anything except for drain your resources and reduce your faith. But, he says, listen to this, instead, pray about everything. Everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Now, let me just help you understand this. Um, you should pray, according to Scripture, about everything. Now, is it wrong to pray, God, bless me today? Is that a wrong prayer to pray? No, it's not. Why? He says pray about everything. Uh, Is it wrong when you go to the grocery store to pray for a parking spot? No? I know we pray specifically for a close parking spot because we're lazy, 
And uh, I, I just don't understand uh, that. I'd rather park at the end of the parking lot so nobody bangs my car with their doors and walk another 100 yards uh, than to park close and have somebody mess my car up. That's just me, all right? But my point is this. Don't miss this. We should pray about everything, he says. Nothing wrong with play, praying for a parking spot. Nothing wrong with praying about your health. Nothing wrong praying that God gives you Safety, traveling back and forth to work. Why? He said, pray about everything. Everything. Every concern that we have in our life. However, not every prayer is an audacious prayer. Praying for a parking spot is not the same thing as an audacious prayer. Let me define for you what an audacious prayer is. And you may want to write this down. An audacious prayer is praying for the mission of God. Not my own safety, not my own comfort, not for God to bless me. I'm praying for the mission of God. What did Joshua pray for the son to stand still for? Why did he pray that? Because he was on mission for God. He was doing something that God had told them to do. And he's like, God, I need your help. So it's a prayer that is praying for the mission of God in a way that requires the power of God. Do you think it required God to intervene for the sun to stand still? Sure did. That had never happened before or since in the history of the world. Sun, stand still. What was Joshua praying? He was praying for the mission of God in a way that required the power of God while seeking the glory of God. Of God. You see, I can pray a prayer that maybe uh, I say, well, I can be on mission for God, but it doesn't seek God's glory. Or I can pray a prayer that requires the power of God, but maybe it's not about the mission of God. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, we pray audacious prayers uh, sometimes as a church. We prayed audacious prayers when we started this church. We pray that God would help us to break down denominational barriers, that God would help us to look like heaven. In other words, we wanted to be a racially diverse church that looked like heaven, and we prayed that God would help us reach people that need Jesus Christ. Do you realize that nearly almost every month of our existence, we baptize people that have met Jesus Christ for the first time? It's amazing. God is that, that was an audacious prayer. Why? Because it was about the mission of God, requires the power of God, and brings glory to God. When we help start in Dawe Yatimba, that's the children's village in uh, South Africa, in Petersburg, uh, St. Uh, Petersburg, uh, South Africa. I'm sorry, Peter Meritsburg, South Africa. Uh, Bob and I, Bob Graham, the founder, uh, we flew there, and we were looking for land. We were praying that God would empower us to rescue AIDS orphans in Africa, in South Africa specifically. We didn't have the money. We didn't have a location. We didn't have a place for them to live. But you know what we knew? That God had the power to make it happen. To make a long story short, we walked on, this has been years ago now, we walked on an exotic bird farm, which, by the way, was one of the most profitable bird farms, exotic bird farms in the world. Now, they weren't selling chicken, okay, but they were selling these exotic birds all over the world, and they were making money. It was an older couple, and they, they wanted their children to continue this legacy, and we walked on that property, and we prayed an audacious prayer that God would give us that location. Now, I just got to be honest with you, it was kind of grassy and grown up among all these bird cages and stuff. And we walked circumspectly because we were told that there were cobras in the grass. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you got to have the power of God if you're going to walk around cobras, all right? And we prayed. And Bob didn't have the money. But today, there's a 10 acre, it's not a bird farm. But it's, a, it's in Dawia Temba. It's a children's village that we started with two little girls. Two little girls. 
and uh, these two girls are graduating from high school now, and uh, they are getting ready to go into the world, having been saved, having been baptized, having followed Jesus Christ, and they're ready to make an impact on their family and on their culture because there were some people that prayed audacious prayers that said, you know what, this is about the mission of God, and it's going to require the power of God, and it's for the glory of God. That's an audacious prayer, an audacious prayer. You can pray an audacious prayer. That's the first question. What is an audacious prayer? The second question is this. Does God want you to pray audacious prayers? There is no command anywhere in Scripture to pray that the sun stands still. But there are examples, and I'm going to share a few of them with you, of people throughout Scripture that prayed audacious prayers. They prayed prayers that required the power of God. And by the way, these weren't like spiritual superheroes. They were people with feet of clay just like you and me. I know we hold Abraham in high esteem, and we should. He was one of the great characters, one of the great people in Scripture. But did you know that if that dude were a member of the average modern church today, he'd probably get kicked out. The dude failed and sinned all the time. Not once, but twice. Twice. He said, well, my wife is my sister to keep from getting out of trouble. Now, I'm not putting a guy like that Uh, in charge of our marital counseling here at at Avalon Church. I'm just not, okay? But he prayed audacious prayers. And so the question is, does God want you to pray audacious prayers? And the answer is yes. Moses prayed to see God. What an incredibly audacious prayer. And you know what God said in response? First of all, he said yes. But here's what God promised Moses in response to that prayer, he said, I'll give you my presence. By the way, do you know when Jesus became incarnated in human flesh, in other words, he inhabited a human body, he was God and became human. Do you know what one of his names, Emmanuel, means? God with us. When Moses was praying to see God, God said, I will be with you. And then he promised to give him favor and rest. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like what God promises to every person that asks to be saved. I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will give you my favor. Yes, you have sinned. Yes, you don't deserve it. Guess what? We don't deserve God's grace. That's why it's called grace. It is unearned. It's unmerited. It's undeserved. And God gives it freely, freely. Peter prayed to walk on water, and he did. Jesus was amazed throughout the New Testament, the Gospels, at people's faith. My point is this. God wants, him, wants us to treat him like God Sometimes we treat God like a vending machine or an ATM. That's about the biggest picture we have of God. But do you realize that you have within you the Holy Spirit of God? Do you realize you have the most incredible power in the universe at work in you? Not just for you, but in you. God wants us to pray audacious prayers. And then here's the final question. How can you pray an audacious prayer? How do you do it? Well, I want to give you four example prayers uh, that will show us how to do this. The first one is what I call a transformational prayer. It's found in Genesis chapter 32. I won't read the passage, but I'll tell you the story. Jacob is coming home after being away for 20 years. You remember Jacob and Esau, the two twin brothers, and Jacob was a con man. His name meant supplanter. And he tricked Esau, his older brother, out of his birthright and out of his blessing. That was a big deal in that culture. And Esau told him, the last time he saw him, he said, if I ever see you again, I will kill you. Go forward 20 years. 
uh, Jacob had become very wealthy. God had given him great success. And he was coming home. And he heard that Esau was coming. <laughs> and he was afraid he was going to kill him. So Jacob divides up his family into groups, his property into groups, and begins to send these gifts ahead to Esau, hoping that that would appease him. The Bible says in Genesis 32 that he sent his family, his flocks, his herds, all of his wealth. He divided it into two camps. And in fact, the place where he prayed to meet God, the name of the place was called Mahanaim, which means the place of two camps. And what happened there was incredible because the Bible tells us that Jacob that night was alone. That's very important. And that night he prayed, and the Bible tells us he wrestled with an angel. In fact, the Bible tells us that it was the angel of the Lord, which is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ himself. Now, I don't know about you, but can you imagine wrestling with Jesus? I'm not talking about just like mentally or emotionally. Physically, he was wrestling with Jesus. And the Bible says that he wrestled with him all night long. And the morning time approached, and Jesus told him, he said, let me go. The, the day is approaching. He said, not until you bless me. Now, that word bless is an interesting word. Uh, it indicates God's favor, God's salvation, and God's forgiveness. A transformational prayer is what Jacob was praying. He said, God, I'm a mess. I'm a deceiver. I've gained all this wealth, and I'm not sure that it was honest the way I got it. The last time I saw my brother, he said, if I ever see you again, I'm going to kill you. And I've got all this wealth, and I've got all this family, God. I'm a mess. And I needed you to change me. And the Bible tells us, this is a beautiful picture, that the, he would not let him go, and the Bible says that the angel Lord, Jesus, touched his hip, touched his hip, and it put it out of socket. Now, I don't know that he punched him, but he has the power to do that, and um, I don't know, punched by an angel, maybe, I don't know, uh, that would be an interesting sermon, wouldn't it, punched by an angel? But the Bible says that it put his hip out of socket. And it changed the way that he walked for the rest of his life. He never got over it. He never got over it. By the way, do you know what Jesus said to him right before he left? He said, you have been called Jacob. Jacob. But from now on, you're going to be called Israel, which means God prevails. God prevails. God, I'm a mess. I'm a deceiver. I'm dishonest sometimes. God, I need your favor. I need your forgiveness. I need your blessing. And Jesus touched him, and he was changed forever. You want know to call that? That's a transformational prayer. It's really literally a prayer of salvation. And by the way, the mo most audacious prayer a person can ever pray, the most audacious prayer a person can ever pray is for a sinner who knows it and knows that they're not perfect and knows that they have failed and knows that they have sin in their life and they need forgiveness to come to the absolute, perfect, holy God of the universe and ask for his salvation and ask for his favor and ask for his blessing and ask for his forgiveness. You know what that's called? That's called a transformational prayer, and that is the most audacious prayer that a person can ever pray. 
well, I wish I had time to really go into these other three. But the next one is what I would call a missional prayer. And Abraham prayed for a sinful city. Do you remember that his nephew was named Lot? Um, they were, they were sheep herders. They, that's how they got their wealth. They were very wealthy. And the Bible tells us that Lot began to tend his flocks and cast his eyes toward these beautiful, fruitful plains, well-watered plains, and the cities that he went to live in were Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know that God sent down uh, probably a volcano, but it's talked about fire and brimstone. and um, So basically, God destroyed the city. There were many, many sins, but their main sin um, was their abuse of people. And uh, so Lot had cast his lot among the wicked. And Abraham's praying this prayer. He's praying a prayer that God would spare the city. And if you remember the prayer he prayed, he started out this, God, would you destroy these two cities if there were 50 righteous people? And it's like he's negotiating with God. It's an incredible story, an incredible prayer. And God says, no, I, I would spare it. He said, well, and he goes down to 40 and then 30, and he finally at the end gets down to 10 people. He said, would you destroy that city if there were 10 righteous? And God says, no. I would not destroy that city if there were 10 righteous people. And if you read that text, it, it, it's weird how it ends. It kind of ends abruptly. Because you're expecting Abraham to keep on, God, would you, I mean, he's down to 10. God, would you spare that city if there was one righteous person? That's what we expect him to do, but he abruptly ends it. And here's why I believe he does. Because it is a picture of salvation. Abraham's God, would you spare the city if there were 10 righteous people? Sure. Sure. God, would you spare the city if there was five or three or two or one? You know the reason he did not say, God, would you spare the city? Would you spare the people for one righteous person? Is because Abraham knew that there were no righteous people, including himself, in that city. But there would one day come a righteous person, just one, and more than just for a city, more than just for two cities, but literally for the entire world, this righteous man, this God man, the one that became human, the one that left heaven, the one that had never sinned, he would live a perfect life without sin, and he would die on a cross for our sins. And the one man, the one righteous man would be the righteous one that would die for the entire world. You know what I call that prayer? A missional prayer. God, save the city. Now let me ask you a question. Are you praying audacious prayers for God to use Avalon Church? God, would you spare our city? God, would you spare our state? God, would you use us? Are you praying audacious missional prayers? Are you praying that God uses us, that he uses you? He will. If you pray in a way that is for the mission of God, that requires the power of God, that gives all the glory to God. That's what God wants us to pray. He wants us to pray missional prayers. He wants us to pray transformational prayers. And then the third, and I won't be long on this, is what I call a family prayer. And it's found in the book of 1 Samuel. If you remember the story about Hannah, she couldn't have a baby. And she prayed that God would give her a baby. And to make a long story short, she promised, God, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you. And what I call that prayer, I call that a family prayer. And I can say this with all conviction. 
you should be praying family prayers. You should pray for your family. You should pray, well, my dad is not saved. Don't ever give up praying. My grandpa, we prayed for him for 10 years, and he got saved. Uh, we have, I have an uncle, and uh, we prayed for him for over 20 years, and he got saved. What am I saying? I'm saying don't you ever give up. Don't you ever give up on your kids. Don't you ever give up on your mother or your father or your husband or your wife. Pray those family prayers that God, because it is for his glory. You know why we know that? Because Jesus, well, the Bible tells us uh, in the New Testament that God is not willing that any should perish. In other words, he doesn't want anybody to perish, but that all should come to repentance. It doesn't mean that all do, but it is his will for every person to come into forgiveness, to come into redemption, to come into justification, to come into a relationship with him. That's his will. So when you're praying for your family to be saved, when you're praying for your children or your grandchildren or your aunt or your uncle or the person you work with, God says, pray those prayers. Pray those family prayers. And the last prayer is the prayer of faith. This may be the most audacious prayer of all. It's the kind of prayer that you pray when you're in pain, when you're in trouble, and when you have no hope. I wish I had time to read Psalm 3, but you could read throughout the book of Psalms. And you'll find many prayers that fit this pattern. David was in pain. In Psalm 3, let me describe the pain he was in. His own son was trying to kill him. And I'm not using that as a metaphor. That was literally what was happening. His own son had deposed him off of his throne. And David was hiding in a cave, living like an animal. And the most heavy burden of all was his son turned against him. Let me ask you a question. You ever been in pain? You ever had to pray an audacious prayer that says, God, I thank you for my pain. I thank you for what I'm going through. God, I've prayed for healing, but thank you for my sickness because it's made me closer to you. God, I prayed for a raise at work because I'm in trouble financially, but thank you that I'm having to trust in you. God, I've prayed for healing, but it hasn't happened, but I thank you. You ever prayed an audacious prayer like that? Well, here's the pattern. You read the first part of that Psalm. David was saying that these people are saying that not even God would help him. Now, I don't know if you've ever been that low or not. I don't know that I've ever been that low that people say about me, not even God loves that guy. Not even God would help that guy. You ever been there? Well, that's where David was. And I want you to listen at what he ended the psalm with, the end of the psalm. He's in all this pain. He's crying out to the Lord. He says, God, people say that not even you would help me. But then he ends with his faith. Here's what he says. Salvation belongs to the Lord. I'm in pain, God. My son has turned against me. He's trying to kill me. I have more family problems than I can shake a stick at. I feel like, God, you have neglected me. You have abandoned me, God, but salvation belongs to the Lord. You ever been there? God, I've, want, I've wanted you to heal me so bad, but it hasn't happened yet. And I know that I'm in this pain for a reason. And Lord, I turn to you and I say salvation belongs to the Lord. God, I'm praying for my family. I'm praying for my husband. I'm praying for my wife. But salvation belongs to the Lord. It is the prayer of faith. I know this. Pain is inevitable. But how we handle it is optional. 
You can either handle it in faith audaciously. Just like the Apostle Paul, he prayed three times that God would remove the thorn from his flesh. And here's what he said God said to him on the third time. My grace is sufficient for you. Now, I don't know what pain you're going through, but I know you're going through pain because that is the human condition. And I don't know what struggles you face, but I know that you are struggling because that's what life is. Oh, it's not all bad. I'm not suggesting that. And there's so much good, and thank God for His grace and mercy. But here's what I know. You can pray and be faithful to God in spite of what you're going through, in spite of your problems, in spite of your pain. Why? Because salvation belongs to the Lord. And it's up to Him. And He will get glory if I will simply trust in Him. Audacious prayers. Son, stand still. What sun stand still moment do you need in your life? You're praying for the glory of God, for the mission of God, in a way that requires the power of God. Sun stand still. Sun stand still. Sun stand still. God honors audacious prayers. Heavenly Father, we come to you with an audacious prayer that would you, you would use us for the mission of God in a way that requires the power of God that will bring glory to God. So Lord, we pray for that. I pray for every person here today that is in pain, is struggling. God, let us pray transformational prayers. Let us pray missional prayers. Let us pray, pray family prayers. And let us pray the prayer of faith. Because we know salvation belongs to you. In Jesus' name. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.